excuse me while I move the electrical cord that I will trip over. <laughs> it goes to the bread machine. Why is the bread machine on? It's not on. It's not on. Good. <laughs> if I can fall, I will. If I can trip, I have. Yeah. I have two big feet. A few other big things, but anyway, big foot. I invite you to share with me in my prayer because I don't know if you've ever been up here, uh, not many of you have, some of you have, you ever been up here to, to, to preach or, ha or say a word to people, you just kind of get humbled by being behind this box. It's kind of like, mm, I'm not sure I want to be there. And, and for years, I argued with God and said, and half a dozen other people, I don't want to be a preacher. No, 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 I don't want to be a preacher. Made a deal with God and ended up in seminary, so watch what you do with God. <laughs> so pray with me. Gracious God, we come before you with open eyes and hearts, and we ask you to... Close our mouths and let us listen to your words. And then, God, I ask that you make the words I have put on paper your words, or at least, and more importantly, that the words these people hear be your words and not mine. All this I ask in the name of Jesus. Okay, rocks. What do you do with them? The rocks in your life. Now, don't tell me I don't have any rocks in my life. Oh, by the way, this is my church, aid, church lady hat. <laughs> when we encounter... Oh, did we get the scripture? Did anybody read it from up here? No, but would you like to? Yeah, put it up here. It says, I'm going to read this one. Give ear, O oh my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears. Can't you just see? Incline your ear to my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. In the sight of their ancestors, he worked marvels in the land of Egypt, in the fields of Zon. He divided, I think, yeah, that's right, Zon. He divided the sea and let them pass through it and made the waters stand like a heap. In the daytime, he led them with a cloud and all night long with a fiery light. He split rocks open in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock, caused waters to flow down like rivers. Amen. I love the Psalms. They're just, uh, when I get down in the deep depths of depression or whatever, you know, I feel like life is too big for me. I read all the way through the Psalms. The first thing I do, first thing I do, is read all the Psalms slowly and thoughtfully. So here's one, one of mine. We encounter stones or boulders in the road of life, don't we? Have you got a few stones? Mm -hmm. They may not be these sizes, these little bitty ones. Or they may be that size. Or they may be as big as those ones out there in the yard. <laughs> or even bigger than that. We want to get rid of those rocks. Sometimes we want to just <laughs> blow them up, right? That sounds like a good idea. That's one way to get rid of them. Make little rocks up. And we can deal with little rocks till they get in your shoe. <laughs> but blowing up rocks is dangerous. Have you ever been where they're blasting? I remember traveling down through I-35 when I was a child. We had been down through there on through the Wichita Mountains when there wasn't I-35. And then we were traveling down through there one time when they were building I-35, and you would hear these boom and all over everywhere. Remember that? Yes. And maybe you've been places 
where those kinds of big explosions have happened. And what, what do you see? Well, we see them on TV all the time. Everything just goes everywhere. It's kind of dangerous. But God has a better way. God has a much better way. In February 2005, there was this mountainous 30-foot boulder teetering above the Pacific Coast Highway in California, and it was a serious risk to people on the road below it and to the houses around it. California State Transportation Department, known as Caltrans, California Transport, engineers studied that problem. They applied a lot of complicated calculations and equations to that situation. Conventional methods of disposing of that boulder were inappropriate because they'd have to. It would have been convenient if they could have applied the approach of the ancient rabbi of Nazareth. You know who he is. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, he said, you could move this giant boulder and say, move over there. Right? You could. And you know what? Tell me what would happen. It would. It would move. Right. Well, Moses, we heard that story down here. Moses had to learn how to deal with rocks. God told him, hit the rock with a staff and streams of water will come out because people were crying for, we don't have anything to drink. Before that, they were yelling, we don't have anything to eat. They were a gritchy bunch of people, weren't they? We're not gritchy. No, we're happy with life just the way it is. The traditional approach to disposing of those huge rocks like this is simply to blast them to smithereens. You have to use blasting paper. It's not paper, really. You have to use what they call blast mat to keep this fly rock from flying all over anywhere. And blast mats are made of recycled truck tires or woven rope or steel mesh cable woven together to catch as many of those as they can. Or they can do something like pack mud all around and over the big rock and then blow it up. And the mud kind of slows it down. They had plenty of mud in California. You're supposed to laugh. <laughs> Don't they have plenty of mud in California? We're always hearing about mudslides and all that. There are other ways, of stop, other ways of stopping this fly rock. None is practical for that stone, though. Caltrans crew, I can't say it, Caltrans crew considered mud capping and a lot of other techniques. Nothing they thought of was commonsensical enough to move that 30 foot, 1,200 ton rock. The fly rock danger to nearby homes in the area and the impracticability of completely covering the boulder as big as it was prevented the use of explosives. There are other methods though to do it. Each was perhaps considered, including bursts of electricity shot at the rock. From high voltage capacitors, slugs of water shot at high speed or steel pistons rammed into water filled holes. Can you imagine what that might do? Drill holes, fill them with water, put a big iron thing goes down into it. That might pop it open. In the end, they used these supersized jackhammers called a hoe ram. It's essentially a tractor-mounted jackhammer. You know, my dad used to run a jackhammer. I don't know how he did it. You know, jackhammer, all day long. I don't know how he felt anything in his shoulders and his arms. Goodness, that was something else. But this giant jackhammer they used to destroy this rock by chipping it apart, little pieces at a time so that there were not a big explosion, but it took a while. We all have rocks 
in our life. We already said that. Some are huge. Some are small. They may be at our feet as stumbling stones that block our faith. Or we trip over them. Or they are strung around our necks like millstones and they threaten to sink us down. Or maybe they're lurking in our hearts. They shield us from love or pain or hope or joy. Or perhaps even we might have rocks in our head making us plain, hard-headed toward God. See yourself anywhere there? What kind of rocks do you have in your life? I've got a few to mention for you. How about depression? Infidelity? Despair? Insufficient funds to pay bills? Illness? Broken relationships? Lack of faith in God? No relationship with God. Death of loved ones. The list could go on and on and on. You could probably give me a few more addictions. Shakespeare's Othello said, My heart is turned to stone. I strike it. And it hurts my hand. The rocks of our lives hurt us. If we even notice our stumbling stones or rocks of head, heart or head, our way or those that weigh about our necks, our sins, our blindness, our denials, our bigotries, our hatreds. This is really a negative sermon, isn't it? <laughs> Angers, pride, betrayals, jealousies we carry or trip over ourselves and hurt ourselves or others. We still may not turn to God for healing, even when and if we notice how painful it is. Maybe we just like the pain. I don't think so. There are other ways of stopping fly rock, but nothing is practical for that stone. Lacking expertise, we may choose, as somebody said earlier already, I think it was you, Jeff, we may choose to do the demolition all by ourselves. What did that get you? We tend to deal with things in our, in our way and load up the stones with dynamite whenever we can. We want to explode it and then we hurt everybody around us. We send fly rock debris scattering every which way. We injure other people. We injure ourselves. How smart is that? So how do we deal with the boulders that hang over our heads or are in our paths or in our lives or in our heads? Well, who can do it? I would ask the kids that. Who can do it? God can do that. And God will do it. And there won't be any fly rock. Oh, what an amazing idea. Nothing to clean up, Mama. <laughs> God doesn't need a whole ram super jackhammer. God doesn't need dynamite. God doesn't need high voltage electricity. God doesn't need steel pistons or high speed water slugs to crack apart the rocks in our lives. The psalmist praises God, says, now you gotta forgive me on this because I'm a woman, God is a woman. She splits rocks open in the wilderness. She made streams comes out, come out of the rock. She did so in the desert. She can do so for you and me. The psalmist revisits a critical chapter in the lives of the Israelites. The writer provides in this song, and you know the Psalms are songs, a listing of the awesome things God did for her people. The author, perhaps a teacher, a priest, announces his intention at the beginning. She says, give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ear to my words of my mouth. Then she begins to remind readers and listeners about God's past activity in your life. I recommend you try that. Look at the way God has acted in your life from way back, maybe before you were born. For the Israelites, their enemies with superior weapons had been turned away 
verse 9. God worked miracles in Egypt, verse 12. God parted the sea to allow them to pass safely, verse 13. By day, God led them through that wilderness with a cloud at night and a night and a pillar by uh, cloud in the daytime and a pillar of fire at night, verse 14. And if that wasn't enough, God split rocks open in the wilderness, gave them drink from the deep as abundantly as cool rushing waters. He made streams come out of that rock, caused water to flow down like rivers in a desert. You ever been to a desert? See any water? Maybe. Way out there it looked like there was some. <clears throat> the psalmist ruefully notes, ah, negativity, yet they sinned still more against him. Rege rebelling against the Most High in the desert. <sighs> do we do that? Ouch. But there is a lesson to be drawn here. Whatever the dynamic between a providential God, you got that word providential? A providential, a all-providing God and his people, her people. <laughs> we cannot simply assume that God will intervene on our behalf while we at the same time disregard, disrespect the commandments of God. It doesn't make sense, does it? We cannot expect God to just let all that. On the other hand, God's done that too, and did with the Israelites. So as we're pondering these rocks, or this boulder, perched way above us, about to shatter our lives with disaster, let's at least have the decency not to call upon God only in times of trouble, when we have no history of calling upon God in time of prosperity. So let's not expect God to jump to our aid, to be at our beck and call when we've had a miserable history of listening and being faithful to God. That's why we often prefer to deal with the rocks all by ourselves, isn't it? God isn't listening to me, I can solve this myself. <sighs> no wonder that approach results in all sorts of injury to ourselves and everybody around us because we don't know how to do it. Wouldn't it be better to confess our sins, approach God with humility, understand that God is a cloud and a fire, or parted waters and miracles, is perfectly able to deal with rocks in our lives that need splitting? Wouldn't that be a better idea? So how does God take care of these rocks? You do want to know, don't you? Who knows? Oh, oh, oh. God deals with each of us in a different way. He doesn't solve my problems like he solves yours. He may let me stew in it for a while and just pluck you out. That kind of makes me ticky, but okay. Maybe it's my fault to begin with that I'm in it. <clears throat> we won't go there today. God may create a detour around the rock. Maybe he provides a path in the wilderness that we haven't seen before. Oh, there it is. Oh, the aisle is open. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm awake. Hmm. Maybe he'll show us some toe holes and some hand holes so we can climb over the rock. Hmm. Like the Caltrans engineers, God may simply chip away at that rock until it isn't there anymore. And no fly rock. Hmm. Take a breath. Perhaps there's even another way to look at this we need to go back to the California engineers. The original Caltran plan to deal with this 30-foot 1,200-ton rock boulder perched over the Pacific Highway was to roll it down the mountain. I wonder who thought of that. In a 
controlled manner. <laughs> and later to inject expanding gel inside that big rock to quietly shatter it and disintegrate it over several hours from inside. Hmm. This expanding goo is a special kind of powdered cement called dexpan. It, when it's mixed with water and poured into holes dr drilled into the rock, then it cools, it exerts an improbable 18,026 pounds per cubic inch capacity. I don't even understand that. <laughs> but it was in the, in the article I read. <laughs> It has strength more expansive than the structural concrete or natural rock and is easily able to shatter either one as effectively as dynamite without fly rock and no mess, well, less mess. The Caltrans engineers proposed drilling holes in prescribed patterns into this big boulder, pouring in the goo and then letting chemistry take its course. <coughs> oh, 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 let's call it gooey grace. Okay? <laughs> gooey grace. You know what grace is. We invite God to be present in our lives. We're faithful in prayer and meditation upon God's word. We trust implicitly in God's methods and God's Timing, if that's the most important one at the end, God's timing. We allow God's grace to permeate our souls, our beings, every fiber of our existence. We allow God to be poured out upon and into the cracks and fissures of the obstacles and troubles that confront us. And then, remember that one back there? God's timing. Wait for the pervasive, gooey grace to take over. It isn't that easy, but it sounds easy on paper. Just what happens when these rocks split open? Well, God gave them drink abundantly as from the deep, the psalmist tells us. He made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. These look like rocks to you? Yeah. And there's some more out there. When I came in, I contemplated whether I wanted to bring in one of those big ones and said it. I didn't know where I'd put it. There are some big rocks in our lives, and there are some big rocks out there that we have to deal with. You ever been driving down the road and come something in the road? Yeah, and you had to route around it. <sighs> These do look like rocks, but you know what they really are? We sang it in a song. We read it in the scripture. They are fountains of living water. So the next time you recognize rocks in your life, in your path, remember, it's a fountain. It's a fountain. Fountains of living and life-sustaining water from which we're invited to drink freely. No charge, freely. No fly rock, no residual negative effects. Huh. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? So I want to read to you that scripture again out of the message. I was telling John the message. Sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes doesn't quite get it for us, but this time. Psalm 78, verses 1 through 4 and 6 through 12 from the message. Listen, dear friends, to God's truth. Bend your ears to what I tell you. I'm chewing on the morsel of a proverb. I'll let you in on the sweet old truths, stories we heard from our fathers, counsel we learned at our mother's knee. We're not keeping this to ourselves. You hear this? That's the other part of the lesson that just goes out of the scripture. We're not keeping this to ourselves. We're passing it on to our children and the next generation. God's fame and fortune. The marvelous things God has done. He, whoops, I got to switch over here and start with six. 16. 
He performed the miracles in plain sight of their parents in Egypt. Uh-oh, we're getting another lesson here. Out on the fields of zone, he split the sea. They walked right through it. He piled the waters to the right and to the left. He led them by day with the cloud. He led them by night with the fiery torch. He split walks, rocks in the wilderness. Gave them all they could drink from underground springs. He made creeks flow out from sheer rocks and water pour out like a river. Wow. Who'd have thought? Amen.